which really tells you what he thinks of it. I don't want to make black people's lives better by giving them somebody else's money. Public dollars are not ours. We do not pay taxes, apparently. I want to give them the opportunity to go out and earn more money. One of the things I want to point out, though, is, okay, Rick Samtorm was a hot mess. <laughs> did not follow the playbook, all right? There was a playbook, and he didn't follow it because he got all explicit about black people. But I want to show you something. This is the way, this is the same message. This is the exact same message, but look at this message construction. This is Eric Cantor. This is all on the Ryan budget. Those at the bottom end of the income scale want nothing more than to increase their income to get up that ladder of success. How are you feeling? You with them? You with them? Say it, come on. Be honest. Yeah. You are. Because who, who of us doesn't want that? Yeah. So the goal should be, how do we do that, right? Reasonable question, yes, I'm there. That is the question we should be posing to ourselves. I've never believed that you go raise taxes on those who have been successful. Who have been successful? Is it us? No. no. That are paying in. <laughs> paying in. Oh, the people who pay taxes. That's not us. <laughs> I didn't get the memo. You all probably still paying taxes. Maybe we should. We need to get that memo. Yeah. Um, taking from them so that you just hand out and give to someone else. <laughs> this is the same message. This is the exact same message, but this is the dog whistle. This is the I can say it, you can't call me racist, and we all know who we're talking about. Okay? This is what is driving our national policy conversations. It drove health care. It's now driving what we cut. We're having a conversation about race, and it largely means disinvesting in all people, including white people, and doing it by making us the enemy. And by taking the very policies that have helped us, but not enough, and the very fact that we have not been helped enough to use against us to call to blame us, to blame us for essentially being structurally excluded from opportunity, and now being used, and not just us, I mean all communities of color. You went to South Dakota, this message would be about Native Americans, um, right? If we're healthcare, it was you know uh, illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've just expanded the way we do this, but there's no question that this is a highly racialized message without being race explicit. And certainly, putting aside his intent, racialized in how it impacts how people are now thinking about whether or not they support these policies. Um, so just to say then where we are in this policy conversation and thinking about what the conditions of our communities, this is what's on the chopping block. Food stamps. Medicare, what we're reimbursing doctors for seeing elderly people. Mm -hmm. Un temporary unemployment insurance. Child tax credit. You know, earned income tax credit. By the way, all these are race neutral policies. They're also all deeply critical to helping us get by and to investing in us having some additional opportunity. So we're racializing the conversation and we're chopping the things our communities disproportionately need, but frankly, the whole country needs right now. I already talked about transit. So let's talk about where philanthropy is right now, and this is a very broad view picture. This is not a very particular wide rise one. Okay, so the good news is investing in advocacy works. This is, um, uh, you all have probably seen this study uh, from the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy looking at the impact of funding advocacy. 110 organizations in 13 states, they received 231 million from at least 321 foundations and other donors over three years. They produced $26.6 billion in benefits for their communities and taxpayers, okay? Funding advocacy pays. But this is now what's happening. So this is very, um, again, this is, a, this is an important study. So first of all, let me go back. So first of all, generally nonprofits get most of their dollars from government, and this is all nonprofits, right? All types of nonprofits, um, generally getting 40, roughly 43 percent of their funding from government. Um, foundations actually account for less than 15 percent. Individual 
donors who give in dues, some of that's also dues, membership dues, a little bit higher actually than foundation giving. But black nonprofits, black nonprofits get virtually no government dollars, less than 20%. I think the number was uh, 19%, get much fewer foundation dollars and really rely on individuals. And again, a lot of that's going to be small donation, right? Not actually big major donors, but small. Small givers. We do have, as many of you know, a much higher level of philanthropic giving as individuals in, in the black community. That's a huge asset. Um, so we're not getting our dollars in the same way. Uh, there, there, there's one good thing about this, by the way. I mean, I would argue that this is generally bad because it means there's an equity issue going on and whether we're actually accessing, you know, philanthropic dollars. The good news here is that gives us more freedom for advocacy because when you get individual donor money, you're a lot more free to say what you want and do what you want. Um, but look at the trajectory of foundation giving for a black community. In 1998, grant dollars to African-American-led organizations was roughly 3%. We of the largest funders in the country, roughly 3%. 2006 grant dollars, 1.5%. Okay? Drop in funding to traditional civil rights groups, that's just one cut of, of obviously, but the primary place in which our advocacy happens, 12% um, cut over the decade. And funding from foundations. Um, there's the source for this, uh, for, for some of this data, um, the graph in particular. So what's happening in the funding community is at least we get individual donors because that frees us. We're getting a lot less money. Foundation dollars are shrinking as our needs are growing and as we are becoming the whipping children for the right to actually disinvest in America. So what does that mean? I mean, I think the opportunity here, philanthropy pay, pays an extre plays an extremely important role. Black philanthropy is critical, critical to bringing the structural lens, critical to trying to leverage more resources. But if the resources are not for advocacy folks, if they are not helping us drive policy, and by that I don't mean not drive, I mean that includes funding community. I'm not talking about just an elite level. I'm talking about organizing in communities. I'm talking about building up leadership. I'm building up institutions. We do need, still need service delivery. It's not antithetical. Sometimes it's how we help service providers do advocacy in addition to delivering the services they're delivering. Um, but the point is, if we're not doing that, we're not even contesting in the fight for the soul of the nation. Because right now, contextually, we are in a fight for the soul of the nation. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have people of color becoming the new majority, we are seeing the biggest retrenchment in investment in our greatest resource, our people, that we have seen in 70 years. And the trajectory is just getting worse. And we have the power to shift that. Thank you. Reality 
reality is we're not all in the same boat. So there's a fascinating, for example, Asian Pacific Islanders, particularly Pacific Islanders, have some of the worst unemployment rates and social indicators of any of us, even worse than black. Um, but they're not segregated. They're not segregated. They're, they typically, you know, there's a very, in part because of the policies that tell people where they're going to live, right? So a lot of this is because of refugee status and people being told what Asians are put in white community. So there, so the segregation conversation makes no sense, you know, in that context. Um, the say, you know, as we saw, uh, you know, there are very structural issues related to immigration status is going to be very different for some communities than others. Um, so while we all have the same needs, we're, we all also prioritize and, and frame them differently. <coughs> so one of the things we have to do is look at how we identify our top priorities that are most likely to impact all of us positively that we can work on together. Um, one, I would argue, is going to be flat out just whether we're investing in public programs. Um, so I think the strategy is how do we create the engagement strategy where we're building up the local institutions and leaderships to actually have the strategic conversation. If there's no way that right now we can avoid a fight about whether uh, that's fundamentally about whether we're going to reduce the deficit or invest in people in order to get out of this crisis and whether people, communities of color are going to benefit. And then how communities of color need to benefit is going to be slightly different by different communities. And we have to have the relationships to be able to have the conversation about how it has to happen slightly differently depending on, on, on the structural arrangements of different communities of color and be able to support each other in those differences. Great, okay. So then there's a couple of questions that have to do with um, kind of uh, financial uh, community development and um, they're, they're posed two ways. One is how can we create opportunities to be more self-sustaining and, and then related, maybe related to that is um, the role of finance and local investments mm -hmm. in black communities. Can this make a difference even before or even if we don't change those structural contexts that you just brought Yeah, I mean, so I think these are really important questions. Um, the, the, and then just very much giving my own you know, my own personal opinion here, um, I think rational minds can differ on this. Um, I, so I would say two things. Nobody is self-sustaining. There is not one wealthy white person in this country that is self-sustaining. We are sustaining them, because they're not paying tax. We, we're, we are supporting the infrastructure they rely on. We're supporting the public schools they're trying to drive the workforce from. There is no, so I think, I mean, so I think we have, a, for a lot of really, really strong, good emotional reasons, a desire for, for self to sustain ourselves. It's not actually the way things have, are structured. And if we don't recognize how wealthy white people are not self-sustaining, I think we're fighting the wrong fight. And the reality is we should be just as sustained as wealthy white people are. I mean, that's what I would argue, which means they got to pay their fair share. they got to support the public infrastructure. They've got to, I mean, so I do believe in agency. You know, I mean, I think what we're really talking about is we want our own agency. We want to be able to drive the conversations. We want to be able to drive policy. We want to be able to say what works, what we need, and be able to impact that. That's what I think of. I, so I think of it as agency, not self-sufficiency, um, because n nobody successful in this country is self-sufficient. Um, secondly, what I would say on the issue of, you know, I think microfinance, um, community economic development strategies are critically important, and I think it's very, it would be wrong for us to talk about an either or. It's also wrong for us to talk about a sequencing that says this, then that. Because the way structure works is it, we can't be linear in that way. Um, the reality is community economic development, financial, local financial strategies, are one of the tools we can deploy, and but they also have to be deployed in a context that recognizes policy has to shift. I mean, even for some local community economic development policies are impacted by uh, strategies are impacted by policy. Um, whether we have a success, we're fighting right now with. Um, I shouldn't say we're fighting. We would like to have this fight. Um, you know, there is uh, there are really important black economic development thinkers trying to figure out how we get broadband in communities of color. 
because really folks, we're not getting anywhere in the 21st century. Economy, social, mm -hmm. political, uh, the political economy, let alone the you know financial economy, without broadband. And our communities do not have access, equal access to broadband. We do not. Um, so some of these folks are thinking, you know, let's drive telework centers that bring broadband infrastructure as well as computer literacy training and a job ladder. And, and tele telework is not telemarketing. This is about digital document conversion. This is very much 21st century uh, economy stuff, but it requires the infrastructure. You can't get the financing. Couldn't get the public financing. So if we're not driving the conversation about web, but you know what, Verizon does. Verizon gets lots of public financing. AT&T gets public financing. Again, they're not self-sustaining. We're just not directing the resources. So I think even some of these really, really innovative e community economic development policies, we're in it as a policy strategy group because they can't get the economic development done without a policy strategy. And even if they get it all through private venture capital, which is now part of our shared strategy is see if we can incubate it, get a success story so that we can make, because otherwise other communities won't be able to replicate it. You'll be able to do it in New York because you got a lot of rich Wall Street types mm -hmm. and you will not be able to replicate it in Mississippi. Well, how is that a victory? That's one community, but guess what? We don't just live in New York. We, we need something that's replicable where our communities are across the country. Okay, a couple of questions about philanthropy. Um, one really sort of, I'm glad that somebody asked the obvious, why are the numbers so low in terms of philanthropic investment in black communities? So low and declining, I guess. So, I mean, I actually think that's a question we should throw back out to the audience because I think you all are really sitting on the front lines and probably have information I don't even have. So I think that that's a really important discussion. Okay. I mean, I'm willing to weigh in, but yeah. Because you said black lead, right? That, you, that's right. what you said. That's the difference right. between there is funding in black communities, but it's often not given to organizations that are black lead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even, even that's absolutely true. And if we parsed it out that way.